Good morning, Foothills. It's great to see you here on the day before the 4th of July. I don't know about anyone else out there, but I am psyched for tomorrow. I've got barbecue plans, going to go see some fireworks, going to enjoy it. I see some red, white, and blue out in the audience today. I have this incredibly gaudy America shirt that whenever my wife looks at, she has to immediately look away because it's so fashion, like not, like opposite of whatever is trendy. But it's great, and I love it, and I'm excited to celebrate for the 4th of July. You know, we talked about, we get to celebrate freedom, we celebrate liberty, and we like to talk about that. We like to talk about the country we have on this weekend. And we're going to have a movie today that's kind of patriotic. It's got some uh, good America stuff in it. Uh, but before we get to that, we've got a couple announcements. Uh, any of you who have known Herb for the last, I don't know how many years, but I know it's been a lot, he always sits back and by that... Uh, that column, both services and listens. Uh, he was in the in the Navy, served in the Pacific. Uh, he passed away then with the recently, and we are going to have a funeral for him Saturday, July seventh. That's going to be at ten a.m. It's going to be here. He's been part of our church for so long. We appreciate everything he did in fighting for our country. So if you're interested, if you knew Herb, if you've, if you've seen him and know who he is, come on down on Saturday, 10 o'clock. We're going to have a funeral for him. Um, but today we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about America, a little bit about the freedom that we have in Christ, the freedom that God has given us. And the way we're going to talk a little bit about that and the way we're going to move into that is we're going to talk about Top Gun. Yeah, I don't know if anyone has seen the new one that came out recently. I've only seen it like three times. It's, it's great. It's amazing. Tom Cruise is awesome. Uh, it's a ton of fun. But we can't get all the movie scenes from that one yet. So I was like, I guess I'm going to have to do the old one because the movie scenes are definitely out for that one. Uh, but why are we going to talk about Top Gun? Uh, it's more than just Zach wants a fun excuse to talk about Top Gun on Sunday. It's, that's, that's not the reason. It's a good reason, but it's not the reason. Uh, the reason we're going to talk about Top Gun is because we get to follow in that movie Tom Cruise's character, Pete Mitchell, call sign Maverick. And we see, it's so funny, I, I read all these articles after the movie, you know, after the movies come out, and they're like, you know, call signs aren't really that cool. We kind of try to make fun of people with call signs. And Maverick is now the coolest call sign, right? But for a while it wasn't, because a Maverick is someone who's a little rebellious, a little bit strange, a little bit kind of out there. And in the movie, that's how he starts, right? He's going all over the place. He's out there. He's not really following any of the Navy's rules. His family name isn't that good in the Navy because his dad was on this mission. And they're like, oh, his dad just took off with a plane and left. So there's all this stuff going on for him. And he is a little bit out there. So he gets that call sign, Maverick. But through the course of the movie, he learns something. And we had in that little video that pops up, our little bump right before the message, we talk about, you know, there's these biblical truths in movies. That's why we're doing this series. Not just because it's fun to talk about movies, but because in great stories, we find biblical truths. That's what makes a story great, is when there's an element of truth to it. Look at any of the big, popular movies that people have gone to, the ones that captivate, the ones that are interesting, the ones that are the best movies. They have stories that pieces of them point to Christ. And the piece of Top Gun that points to God and the community of God and a truth from the Bible is that you can never leave your wingman. At the beginning of the movie, Tom Cruise is this character, Maverick. He'll just fly out. He's got an incredible pilot ability but he kind of does whatever he wants. He gets in trouble all the time. He's always doing flybys, which while super cool, are not allowed. <laughs> At least every time he asks for them, negative Ghost Rider pattern is full. But he does them anyway. Keeps getting in trouble. He's a maverick. He's out there on his own. And we can see in the movie how that affects him. But before we jump into the movie a little bit, I want to tell you what a wingman is in Christianity. Because I don't know how many of you have a pilot's license or a pilot or are flying sorties for the military right now. I don't think the number is very high. So when I say you need a wingman and you're never supposed to leave your wingman, what am I talking about? I'd like to point out real quick, I looked up the definition of wingman. I was like, are there wing women? I don't know. And I looked it up. It is gender neutral. So it's like mankind. I'm sorry, ladies, if that's offensive to you, but we're going to move forward. When I say wingman, I mean you too. Why are we always supposed to have a wingman? And what is our wingman in the church? 
we talked this morning and uh, Steve came out and read us a great passage to get us ready, right? What was it? Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And I'm going to read it again. And I know Pastor Harvey did it last week and we're just going to keep on going because it is a great passage. And what does Jesus say? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded to you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Go and make disciples. That's what our wingman is. In the church, in this community that we have, whether you're here today, whether you're watching online, whether you're watching in a different state or a different country, wherever you are, in this church community that we have, a disciple is your wingman. Jesus commanded us to go and make disciples of all nations. Go out, he says, in, in another gospel, go out to Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria and then the ends of the world. Disciples are our wingman. And then when we get a group of disciples together, a group of disciples of Jesus, that forms a church. Every single one of you here, if you have given your life to Christ, if you consider yourself a follower of Christ, this is a command for you. Go and make disciples. Why are disciples, why are wingmen so important? Why does Jesus command us? Well, we're going to see a little bit of what happens. We're going to play a scene from Top Gun. We're going to show you what happens. Again, Maverick is a great pilot, but he leaves his wingman. And what happens when he does? Hello, Foothills family. Welcome back to At The Movies. Now, as with previous weeks, we are unable to show the clips that we are showing in the auditorium online because of copyright reasons. Now, I'm going to do my best to explain to you what is happening in these scenes and these clips that we are seeing in the auditorium so that you have a better understanding of what we watched here on campus and understand what Zach is talking about when he's making comparisons in his sermon. Now, the scene we are watching right now in the auditorium is actually the dogfight training exercise where Maverick and Goose and Hollywood and his co-pilot uh, co are paired as wingmen, and they're trying to chase down Viper, as well as another target. Now, as they're flying, Maverick's ego starts to get into his head, and he says, you know what? I think I'm good enough. I can go take Viper on my own. We need to go after him. I have something to prove. So he says, I think I'm going to go after Viper, and Goose says, no, we shouldn't leave our wingman. We need to stay with Hollywood. And Hollywood's like, don't leave me. Do not leave me, Maverick. And of course, Maverick's ego at this point is so high that he feels like he needs to prove something. So he says, Hollywood, you're good, man. You'll be fine. I'm a go. And so he peels off and starts chasing after Viper. Now, there's a lot of action in this scene that we are seeing on campus. And so I'm not going to try to explain to you every single barrel roll or every single swoop or pass by. But what you need to know is they then incorporates an entire scene where they're flying around each other. Maverick's constantly on Viper. Viper even mentions how good this kid is, this young buck that's come up uh, to the Top Gun Academy and is trying to shake him the whole time. And the scene plays out, but at the end, what ends up happening is Viper's wingman, Jester, actually sneaks up behind Maverick and Goose and gets them. And obviously, this is a training exercise. Nobody is hurt, but through teamwork and by having a wingman, they gun down this young buck who was a hot shot. And so they all fly home, and Goose makes a comment about, you know, uh, pretending to be the DOD and saying, you know, we regret to inform you that your sons died because they were stupid. So we cut to the scene in the locker room and Iceman comes up to Maverick and he says, you know what? You need to pick a side. Are you even on our side? You should never, ever leave your wingman. And he basically says something along the lines of, 
you're you're against us at this point. You're fighting against us with all of these hot dog antics that you have. You are very talented. Even Viper comes in and says, you are very talented. However, all of this solo work and trying to go it alone is going to get you killed and probably the rest of us killed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send you back into the auditorium so that Zach can discuss a little bit about why these themes of partnership and teamwork are so important in our lives as Christians. Here we go. Whose side are you on? It's a great question, right? We try to keep that scene at the end in there because I love how Iceman calls him out. He's a great flyer. He's got great skill and ability, but what's he doing? He's going off on his own. He leaves his wingman and what happens? He gets shot down, gets hit. It's 2v1. He's so focused on the guy in front of him, he doesn't check his tail. Gets locked on in the training environment, that's a kill. In Philippians 3, verse 17, it says, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Whose side are you on? It's a great question from Iceman right there. Because he's asking, what are you doing out there? With all your skill, with all your ability, the way you are behaving and the what you're doing is hurting us. So I want to ask you a question today. When it comes to that command from Jesus, go and make disciples of all nations, what does your conduct show? What does your behavior show? Are you out there making disciples? Are you out there pushing forward? Or are you resting on your laurels? Are you resting on the fact, oh, Jesus has got me, it's okay. It goes on to say in that uh, section in Philippians, Paul says, their appetite is their God. And that scene, what does Mav want so bad? There's that, there's that pilot out there named Viper, played by Tom Skerritt. And he's the best there is. He's the one everybody wants to get the glory of shooting down. So because he wants the glory, what does he do? He leaves his wingman. Exposes both of them to getting beat. What does your conduct show? Is your appetite your God, your appetite for things, whether it be material, whether it be praise, whatever it may be? Or are you out there pushing forward to make disciples? Now, maybe you're not sure because maybe you're like, Zach, I don't know what a disciple is. I don't know what it means to, to make a disciple. I don't know how to do that. And that's okay because we're going to talk about it today. I've still got plenty of time before we're supposed to be done. <laughs> so, I want to talk to you about four elements of making disciples. Now, these aren't the only four elements. These are not the only four things to know. These are not the only four pieces of Christianity. If I was going to do that, we're going to have to read the whole New Testament. And we've got barbecues to get ready for tomorrow. But what are the four elements of making disciples? When Jesus says, go out and make disciples of all nations, what does he mean? Well, the first piece is that is the name, the disciple. What is a disciple? A disciple is a follower of Christ. But what were the disciples when you think of those? You think of the 12 that were with them, right? The 12 disciples. We also call them the apostles, but they're also called the disciples because they were with Jesus. They were following him. They were listening to his teaching. Now, we do not have Jesus physically like those men did. He's not here physically on this earth anymore. So when we say discipleship, the first element is being discipled by someone you know or someone in the church, someone who is farther along than you. Think of the disciples. Think of Peter. Peter was impulsive and brash and would say whatever he was thinking, which was great and also sometimes bad. And Jesus takes him and disciples him for three years. And Peter becomes someone who in Acts is performing miracles because of the spirit being so strong inside of him. Look at John, another one of the disciples. Starts off, all we know is he's a son of Zebedee, a fisherman. And what does Jesus do over three years? 
disciples him, trains him. He becomes one of Jesus' men in the inner circle. And then we see that he writes five books of the New Testament. So the first place for each and every one of us to start with making disciples is becoming one ourselves. And the way we do this is not just by following God, which is part of it. It's not just by going to church, but it's seeking out someone to mentor us. You know, Top Gun, it's a fun movie, it's great, but it's based on the real Top Gun program. The Navy's tactics and strike fighter, I can't remember all the words, but you know, it's a naval program to make the top pilots in the Navy better. And they get mentors like Jester and Viper and these guys that have done it for years and know every single thing about a plane. Even the best in the Navy go to Top Gun to get better because there's mentors there. None of us is above that. So the first step to making disciples is being one ourselves. And how do you do this? You go out and you find someone. Someone maybe you know them closely. Maybe you've heard of them before. Maybe you don't know them super well, but they're in your church community, whatever it may be, through prayer, through seeking advice from others that you know around you. Find someone to disciple you. A one-on-one -on -one relationship where they can mentor you. We see even after Jesus ascends into heaven, we see Paul do this. Paul had multiple guys around him all the time that he was trying to disciple. So the first thing that you should do is find a Paul. Find someone to mentor you, to disciple you, to teach you what they've learned in their walk with Christ. And it's not to learn who they are necessarily. It's not to learn that they are your new idol is that they are one of many role models and they can teach you what they've learned in their relationship with Christ. And, and make no mistake, when I say a mentor, I don't mean like a work mentor. I don't mean like those things can be good. But I mean find a specific person who has been walking with God for a long time to disciple you. Now, after you do that, it takes, it's pretty quick. It takes about six to 12 months. The next step is to go make disciples yourself. Again, this is something you do through prayer. You seek counsel from those around you, see who they know. Maybe who you end up discipling is someone you know. Maybe it's someone who's close to you. Maybe it's someone you've known for years. Maybe it's somebody you just met in a small group or at church. But once you've been discipled and you have become a disciple of Jesus and you know you are, you go out and you make more disciples. You make disciples of all nations. That's number two. The third thing we do is small groups. See, we have, we have a Paul, someone who can mentor us, guide us in walking with Christ. We have somebody who is a Timothy, someone who we are further along than, that we know and we are trying to guide. And make no mistake, you're going to learn a lot from them too. When I've done discipleship in the past, I've learned a lot. <laughs> it's not just like you're teaching and you know everything because none of us do but you're trying to help them walk along. That's like a Timothy. That was Paul and Timothy's relationship. That's why we have first and second Timothy because Timothy was discipled by Paul and Paul was discipling Timothy. So after you have a Paul, after you've been being discipled, after you are walking with Christ and you have someone who is trying to help you walk with Christ, then you go and you do the same for others. You use the knowledge and the wisdom that God has gave, given you you move forward with that. You step out and it can feel like a little bit of a risk or a time commitment sometimes, but you make that decision anyway. And then we move to small groups. Small groups are important because we have a Paul and a Timothy, but we need people around us to tackle life together. People who we are close to that can help us when things are difficult, that we can help when they are going through a difficult time people who are like us that we can build good friendships and strong relationships with, with in a small community. And that small community is important because you're close enough that you will be challenged. My wife and I have been in a small group for about two years now of other young married couples. There's eight of us right now. And it's so cool because we have different backgrounds and different thoughts and different takes on things. We have different ideas about what it means to follow God, about how you should apply our faith in different situations. 
So we hear different viewpoints. We talk about these things and discuss them. We try to figure out the truth of God. And we all know each other. We care about each other. We're friends and we step up to help each other when it's needed. It's a small community that can work together and do good things. Paul was discipling Timothy, but as he was discipling Timothy, he was also going out on missions trips. And some of the missions trips he went with Barnabas. And Barnabas and him challenged each other. They had disagreements. Find a Paul, find a Timothy, find a Barnabas. All three of these are pieces of making disciples. They're pieces of forming community. And the last element, the fourth element, is to be part of the church. Not just foothills, not just a church down the street from you, but part of the church, the church that Christ left for us. The church that Christ left for us is powerful. He works through thousands, millions, over a billion people now are part of the church worldwide. God works through all all of them. He wants to work through all of them if they allow him to. And what happens when we're a church? I have never been to volunteer for the food pantry here. The food pantry here feeds over a thousand people. I think it is a week. It's amazing how much food they put out. So many people volunteer to help it. The people who run it work hard at it and do a great job. And I've never volunteered for it. I've never been a part of helping out. I believe it's on Wednesday and Friday that they have it now. There's been times where they have had so many volunteers, they have too many, which is a great problem to have. But I have never helped out with the food pantry, not personally. But am I not a little bit part of that because I am part of the community that it's in? How about the missions team? We send missions groups, we've sent them to India, to Ecuador, to Haiti. That's part of our community, right? Right? but I have not personally been. And I don't know how many of you guys want to get up here and try to preach. You're welcome to right now if you want to give it a shot. But, <laughs> but right? We all contribute in different ways. Some of us, I know I look out there, I know some of you are small group leaders. I can see a couple guys on the security team, which makes me feel a little bit safer right now. You know, we are all doing different things. The worship team, trust me, if I was on the worship team, you would all leave immediately. It would be very, very bad. <laughs> But we all have different gifts. We all have different talents. We all contribute in different ways. No one could volunteer to help with every single ministry we have. Kids, uh, high school and student ministry, uh, adult ministry with small groups, our, our outreach programs, which includes the food pantry, amongst other things, our missions team. No one here is involved in all of them. But you can be involved in one. So that fourth step, it's being part of the body of Christ. It's being part of what Jesus has left on this world to advance his kingdom and change the world for the better. That's four things I've given you, and that's a lot. The first one is to go be a disciple. The second one is to disciple others. The third one is find a small group and participate in it. And the fourth one is participate in church. And when I say participate, this is a great start. You guys have a great start, but it's not the end. It's not just showing up on Sunday. It's finding a ministry to volunteer in, something to push forward. And guess what? Maybe you have a gift that you look at all the ministries and all the volunteer things that Foothills offers, or maybe you're in another state and you're looking at the volunteer opportunities that your church that's closest to you offers, whatever it may be. And you're like, well, my talents are in this, but they don't have that ministry yet. It's a great opportunity to start one, isn't it? There's no excuses here. What is your conduct going to reveal? Because Paul, when he writes this letter to the Philippians, he's like, look, there's a lot of people out there who are saying they're followers of God, but their conduct reveals them to be the opposite. We've got Maverick who's flying around and leaving his wingman. That conduct is the opposite of what the truth is, of what our goal is, of what Jesus commands us to do. But what happens when we do those things? What happens when we find a, someone to disciple us? We disciple. We are part of a small group. We are part of the active living body of Christ. All those things come together, right? 
Now, parents, if you haven't shown your kids Top Gun yet, I'm sorry, I'm going to show a little bit of the end of the movie. There's going to be some spoilers. You can try to cover their eyes, cover their ears if you're like, man, I really want to watch this with my kids. Because it's a great movie. I get it. But that's your warning. Because we're going to see a little bit of what happens when it all comes together now. Welcome back, Foothills family. Now, in this clip, we are actually seeing yet another dogfight. But this one is for real. This is no longer a training exercise. This is near the end of the movie. And at this point in the movie, spoiler alert, Goose has died. And Maverick has gone through a long journey of dealing with the grief that is losing his best friend and his choices that may have led to his friend's death. And up until this point, he's been struggling with confidence, not being able to get back in the seat. He's flying, but never the way he used to. He's a liability. And, and they get into a situation where they are deployed to action and he is assigned as Iceman, the, the rival of the whole movies, as his wingman. And Iceman complains up until this point that, you know, I don't trust him. He's not ready. He doesn't have the confidence. He shouldn't go up. And all the superior officers say, he's got this. So they go up into the fight. And Maverick's about to leave because he's so shaken over this whole process. But he chooses to re-engage. And during this scene that plays out, he ends up taking down multiple MiGs. And as they're flying around, he shoots one down to protect Iceman, and he starts flying around to try to take down another one, and uh, another MiG comes up behind Maverick, and his co-pilot basically says, we've got to get out of here. We got to, we got to leave. We're going to get, we're going to get hit. And Maverick says, I will not leave my wingman which is completely different than the clip we saw earlier where he immediately left Hollywood. But in this situation of life and death, after he's lost his best friend, he then chooses, after this process of grief, to decide, I'm on this team. I am part of this community and I will not abandon my wingman. And the rest of the scene plays out where they shoot down the rest of the planes and they are victorious, but it's only through the teamwork of them staying around. So here we go back into the auditorium. I'm not leaving my wingman. He figures it out, right? He starts as a pilot who wants to go off and do his own thing and look good doing it, make everyone impressed. But throughout the movie, he learns. And at the end of it, he's got someone coming around on his tail. Someone who's going to put him in danger. But what does he say? I'm not leaving my wingman. I'm sticking with him. And they fight him off. They fight the enemy planes off. They take out a couple. They take out one or two more. The rest fly home. It's a great heroic moment at the end of the movie. Because we see all the elements of this community working together. You know, we only see those guys up there, right? But where'd they come from? Where'd they launch off an aircraft carrier? It's a lot of people. Yeah, like 5,000 people on an aircraft carrier. That's a lot of people to make sure that boat runs right and that those planes go up in the air. They've had their mentors at Top Gun who've taught them how to be better and better pilots. And then when they're up in the air, they've got their guys behind them in the back seat, right? Trying to take care of all the little things that they didn't have computers to do quite yet. And then at the very end of the day, what does Maverick say? I'm not leaving my wingman. One thing that I'm really proud of at Foothills is we don't talk too much about politics. I've never heard anyone say how to vote from up here. I think that's a great strong part of our church because God calls on the church to be a diverse place. So when I say what I'm about to say, I don't mean it to be a political statement for either party. I don't mean it to be a political statement about what should happen in America, but I do want it to be a challenge to us. I want you to think of the political issues that matter the most to you, and I want to ask you why the church community can't solve those problems. Food scarcity in America, kids who get hungry, we have a food pantry that is awesome, and we want to make it bigger and bigger and better and better. If people need clothes or material goods, again, we have an outreach ministry for that. If we have people who believe things that we don't think are true, then we preach the truth of Christ and no other truth above it. Because the truth of Christ and God will handle all these things. 
And I hear often that, you know, if these things happen in America, we could be persecuted as a church, and maybe we could be. Maybe it'll happen tomorrow. Maybe it'll happen 10 years from now. Maybe it'll happen to our kids' grandchildren. I don't know. But it's not like the church has never experienced persecution before. And when it did in the Roman Empire, it grew faster than it ever has. I don't desire in this building to have really political discussions with anybody, but I do want us to go upstream of those discussions. What is the truth of God? What is he telling us and what is he guiding us to do? And when we work together as a community, when we create disciples and expand God's kingdom that way, when we create small groups that help each other and then we are part of a larger church community, that's my answer to the problems we see. That's my answers to the difficulties facing our world, facing our country, that we face as people. When that community works together, it is good. I want to add one little thing, though, because there's excuses, right, that we tell ourselves. Maybe it's a time thing. And look, I got to say, if it's a time thing, it's not whatever you're doing. You can always make time for this because this is the most important thing. If you are a follower of Christ, what is more important than following God's words? So if it's a time thing, I get it, but also this is more important because this is about him and his kingdom. But there is one that I do think is kind of legitimate because I've heard this one a lot. Because I've seen people who have worked hard as part of a church for years and have poured into people and then they get hurt. Because we're people and we're messy. We make mistakes. If you're involved in discipling somebody, you have that close one-on-one -on -one relationship, there will be pain. You may say something or do something that hurts them, they may do something back. If you're looking for someone to disciple, let me warn you, it's not a 100% hit rate. I've asked a lot of people. They haven't all said yes. Sometimes you start and then you're like, after a couple of weeks, they're, they're not in it. It's like, Zach, what if I'm wasting my time on that? I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to open myself up to that pain. And I get it. Because that sucks. I've got one more scene to show you. There's one. Now in this clip, we're in the middle of the movie and it's to his core. Again, spoiler alert. So if you, if you want to show the kids, cover their ears. Maverick loses his best friend. He loses his guy in the back seat. He loses Goose, right? They get caught up in the jet wash. It's an unrecoverable spin. They've got to eject, and Goose hits the canopy when he ejects, and it kills him. Maverick is this incredible pilot, so, so good, and he wants to quit. So where does he go? He goes to a guy who is his mentor. And what's the conversation like? Now, in this clip, we're in the middle of the movie, and it's basically a turning point for Maverick. Goose has died, and he goes to his superior officer and asks him, should I quit? And his, his officer Viper says, that's not my choice. It's up to you. You obviously feel responsible for Goose's death, and you have a confidence problem. And he's like, it's not all sunshine and rainbows here. You have to evaluate what happened. It's the only way we get better. Because up in the sky, we have to push the limits. But it's up to you to decide whether you want to play on the team and stay or go home and feel guilty. I'll send you back into the auditorium. We got to push it. That's our job. When it comes to following God, we don't go halfway. We don't do it just a little bit. We push it for him. So there will be pain. There will be hurt. And if that is really deterring you, the last thing I'll say on it is that Jesus poured into Judas Iscariot for three years. Judas followed him everywhere. He was in his inner circle of 12 disciples. He was close to them. He handled the treasury. And Jesus poured into him and gave him love and grace and forgiveness for three years, knowing what was going to happen. So yeah, discipleship, close relationships, building that community, there will be pain and there will be difficulty. But I don't think that's an excuse. 
Because if anybody did it, Jesus did. And he asks us to follow him. Find a Paul, someone who will disciple you. Find a Barnabas or a group of Barnabases, people that will go through life with you and work with you and challenge you. Find a Timothy, someone you can disciple and find a church to be part of and volunteer with and contribute to the community of. Even the best of us need a wingman. We need a squad. We need people around to mentor us, to learn from us, to overcome things with us. This is the conduct we are called to. Will you accept the call? Let's let Jesse close this out. Movies are a common language that we all share. And this series will allow us to use something that is mostly worldly to have new conversations about the truth of scripture. This is a great series to invite a friend who might be hesitant to come to church. So reach out to that friend or neighbor who you've been thinking about inviting for weeks and bring them to church next week. If you're visiting on campus or watching online for the first time, be sure to learn more about us by texting FHNEW to 72000. We would love to have you be part of our family. Now let's stand for our closing blessing. And if you're doing church at home or watching online, do the discussion questions to go just a little deeper. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come here today. We thank you for giving us a country that is full of freedom, it's full of liberty, and it's full of awesome movies and a little bit of Tom Cruise. Amen.